I'm so pleased to be marking the start of National Reconciliation Week with you. There are many things that makes reconciliation work. The power of repatriation is a key constituent. For many, repatriation is a strong and visible way of acknowledging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander rights and ownership of long-held cultures, stories, tools, artefacts, ceremonies, peoples, knowledges and philosophies and much, much more. In 1994, the University of Sydney commenced a process of repatriation, an incredibly important step for this institution. Today, this same process remains the only independent repatriation project in Australia. It's transformed our relationship with communities in numerous ways and with appropriate consents and permissions, allow our people at the university to have the critical conversations with the community from which these items were taken, often decades before, if not centuries. Over the last 30 years, Australian institutions have led the world when it comes to best practice in repatriation. As with many things, there is still much more that can be done, and yes, we can do better. Our commitment to the One Sydney Many People strategy expects us to create more opportunities for engagement with communities to celebrate culture in an environment where important conversations about our identity and what it means to belong can occur easily. Part of this conversation is shared by today's panel, which will reflect on repatriation as an act of reconciliation. I am proud to present today's panel filmed in collaboration with our friends at the ABC. I sincerely hope you enjoy this dynamic conversation. Hello and welcome to The Journey Home, Reconciliation Through Repatriation. I'm Larissa Berendt. Reconciliation Week serves as an opportunity for Australians to learn about our shared history, culture and achievements. This year's theme of More Than A Word, Reconciliation Takes Action encourages us all to consider how we can contribute to achieving reconciliation in Australia. Reconciliation takes many forms, and on this program, we'll explore the need for repatriation of Indigenous objects and human remains, and the place this complicated and nuanced undertaking has in the reconciliation process. Throughout colonial history, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander ancestral remains and sacred objects have been removed from their communities and placed in museums, universities, and private collections both here in Australia and overseas. I'll be joined by a panel of experts in cultural repatriation shortly to explore this in greater detail. But first, Cornel Ozies is an Indigenous filmmaker who has travelled to Germany to record the repatriation of Indigenous remains taken from far north Queensland. While in Europe, he bumped into his mob from Broome in Western Australia who were also on a mission to collect the remains of their ancestors. This extraordinary story provides an insight into repatriation, truth-telling, and the important role the return of cultural artefacts can play in promoting healing and reconciliation. In 2019, Ani Dai and my cousin Naomi went over to Germany to bring back the remains of my ancestors. This is a very historic journey, very emotional. A phone call from the Lipsig Museum prompted the trip. The museum had discovered 14 remains of pearl divers that were taken from Broome over 100 years ago. Of course, yes, those bones should go back home. We need to make sure they feel safe. So my auntie and cousin travelled with the delegates from Yaru and Garijadi Nation to collect the remains over in Germany. When it comes to the repatriation of human remains and cultural and special objects, it really is a story of reconciliation in action. It's about how did those objects get to where they are? Why are they so far away from their home and their communities? What was the relationship that was going on back then that those um, remains removed? But also what's the opportunity for a new relationship going forward? This is how the remains were held in those institutions. They'd arrived there and they'd sat for up to 100 years in these second-hand uh, food tins. There really wasn't any respect for the fact that they were the remains of deceased people. 
So Guggenia was also part of the group and he's our senior law boss and custodian of our culture. And he was there to bring the remains back. It's colder than any place I've been. I haven't seen the snow yet, but one day. So unbeknownst to my family, I was also in Germany filming with the Jidinji people of the Cairns region. They were also there to get their remains of their ancestor. There was a thriving trade of body parts and remains being collected in the 19th century. And that's how the 14 remains from my people got over to Germany. And they regarded us as savages or animals for them to do such things. I am um, very, um, yeah, very sad. Part of my custom, we use smoking ceremonies to cleanse. And so we took over plants native to Australia to be used in those ceremonies on the day of handing back. After the smoking ceremony, we were then ready to be reunited with our ancestors. Thanks everyone for every effort that has been put into this. Uh, it's very special for us. And now we have a journey going back home to bring them back home, rest them in peace. I wasn't quite prepared for the emotion that I got when I walked into that room and saw my ancestors in a box. We carry this pain, but we carry this healing as well. Seeing those boxes, uh, I was overwhelmed with sadness, happiness. It was so strange to be documenting one group of people, but then being a part of a whole bigger, larger picture. And just being there with family, it was just amazing. So we're feeling very, very sad, but happy at the same time. So there's a little bit of mixture. We have the remains of approximately 200 individuals who we are looking to return to communities because they have fair provenance. The beautiful thing about the people in Germany, they changed the lens on the way they saw our mob. It wasn't just objects anymore, they were people. And that is what made it easier for them to come to terms with giving back our people. Joining me now to take a closer look at the issue is First Nations Director at the Australian Museum, Laura McBride, Curator of Indigenous Heritage and Repatriation at the University of Sydney, Matt Pohl, and Honorary Senior Lecturer at the Australian National University, Dr Lyndon Orman Parker. Thank you so much for being with us. So Laura, I'll start with you. The theme for reconciliation this year, more than a word, reconciliation takes action. For you, where does repatriation of cultural remains and artefacts sit with that concept? A truly genuine process of reconciliation includes addressing past injustices against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Uh, our ancestors and our cultural objects were removed from our communities to be studied scientifically. To undertake the healing process, these objects need to be returned to our communities, both our ancestral remains and secret sacred objects. How about you, Lyndon? For you, how does the concept that we have at Reconciliation Week, especially the idea of action, sit with the notions of cultural repatriation? Thanks, Larissa. Well, repatriation is very important for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, as we've seen in the uh, short film that was just played. Uh, and it's very important because Aboriginal people have been objecting to the removal of their ancestors and family members for many years. The first recorded objection was in 1825, uh, and so Aboriginal people have said no to this. And many Aboriginal people say it's about that sense of healing once those ancestors have, have been returned to country. And so with the Reconciliation Week upon us, it's part of that healing journey of this traumatic past that's been inflicted on Aboriginal people. Matt, and how about you from your perspective and the work you're doing in this space? Why is cultural repatriation important to the reconciliation process? Um, when you look at to some of the unethical contexts in which these remains have been used over the years, you know, racial hierarchies, 
even eugenics and things like that. The, the collection of these remains is just so hurtful on so many different levels, historical and contemporary. When you work with repatriation, like each community is going through different stages of grieving and it's just an important function that museums can do today to actually try and rectify these mistakes of the past, I guess, and actually um, atone for some of the broader historical disadvantage that the collection of these remains represent. Lyndon, can you talk us through, in terms of context, some of the historical events and the ideologies which led to Indigenous cultural objects and remains being taken? Yeah, so many remains were taken uh, for the purposes of comparative anatomy, so, uh, all, and also eugenics, which was also the, you know, measuring people's skulls and the lumps and bumps to interpret uh, personality types. Uh, there were certainly theories of evolution that made a contribution to the comparative anatomy, which meant that uh, there were a hierarchy of races with, of course, white European uh, being at the top of that hierarchy and, of course, uh, Indigenous people often being at the lower end of that hierarchy. And these uh, theories of evolution, uh, the use of comparative anatomy, also led to uh, white superiority, people actually believing that they were superior, therefore the colonial uh, murder and invasion of different countries took place because people were less, uh, were inferior to uh, the white man. That process in, in and of itself uh, created um, mass destruction on a global scale during the colonial process for Indigenous people. Laura, I want to pick up something that you've all mentioned and it's, I wonder if you can speak a little bit more so that a non-Indigenous audience particularly would understand what the impact is of the removal of these objects on First Nations people and their communities? Well, there are family members, our ancestral remains. Um, you look at someone like Truganini, who witnessed her own family and friends being taken into museums and asked if she wouldn't end up in a museum. And um, unfortunately, she did end up in a museum for many, many years. But the removal of all cultural objects has an effect because at the same time, we weren't allowed to practice our cultures and languages. And so often when Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples come into the museum, they're happy to see their objects, but at the same time, it's very emotional. And um, my mission is to try and repatriate as much as possible to our communities uh, in the healing process. Matt, from your perspective, how much knowledge and understanding is there amongst the broader Australian community about this history and whose responsibility is it to educate them? I guess there's not a lot of awareness really of the extent of just how much was collected. I mean, where they've done audits, there's in museum collections around the world, there's more than 250,000 objects, like mostly stone tools, uh, other items that were collected. In terms of the responsibility, I think it's all of Australia's responsibility to learn more about this process and to actually be aware of just how important it is for communities to have these remains, especially back, as well as the objects too. But, you know, to understand the scale of it, I don't think a lot of people really understand that. Lyndon, you've worked in the area of cultural repatriation and heritage protection for a number of years, and you're a recent member of the Australian Heritage Council. I'm interested to get your thoughts on what shifts in attitudes you might have observed with the government on this issue over the years you've been working in the area. We still have some institutions that are a little bit recalcitrant about uh, returning their ancestors, but through continuing lobbying by Indigenous people, uh, institutions are now finally starting to, to turn around and get them and have them back, uh, including from overseas. So we've had over 1,500 ancestors have returned from overseas over the last 10 years. Uh, the Australian government policy has changed in the last 10 years to allow these programs to operate. It was back in 1997 uh, when Ken Kolbung, a uh, Noongar, went to uh, England to request the return of Jägen, uh, a warrior that was killed during uh, the colonial times. And so through his lobbying and the lobbying of the British government for his return, really set in train uh, the British to actually start thinking about repatriation. Laura, we often hear about the concept of truth-telling. Do you think cultural repatriation is an area that's been overlooked within that notion of truth-telling? I think cultural repatriation has been overlooked in the truth-telling process, and that's because not many people are aware of cultural repatriation. Many people, many visitors to the museum are surprised to find out that we still hold 
ancestral remains. Uh, the Australian Museum has been repatriating ancestral remains for around 30 years now, and we still have hundreds of ancestors on site. So I guess awareness is something that can come out of the truth-telling process, being transparent about how many ancestors we have and actively working with communities. We seek out communities, tell them that we are holding ancestors from their areas and work with them to find a way to rebury them in a dignified way. Just want to um, pick up on that with you, Matt. Um, obviously, you work in the curatorial space. And I was just wondering if you could share with us some of your reflections on how communities have responded to the repatriation process. Yeah, it's always interesting. I mean, the first question, I guess, is, you know, why do you have them? And it's a very hard question to answer <laughs> when you put it in the historical context of where they've come from. These days, we're repatriating more historic photos, um, sound recordings, all these different sorts of information, as well as the objects, as well as the ancestral remains to sort of allow communities to have that space to really understand what was going on and really return it to the proper place that they can. I mean, in more than 90% of cases, the remains can't actually be returned to where they were taken from. It's not just a simple matter of just handing the remains back. Communities really need to have as much information as possible to make those decisions so that they can return these ancestors um, respectfully with cultural safety. And in listening to Laura and Matt, the other big picture conversation we have, of course, is about treaties. So what relationship do you see between the process of cultural repatriation and treaty? Um, well, I see uh, treaty as a process of practical outcomes for Aboriginal people and agreement making between all jurisdictions, state and federal governments and Indigenous uh, peoples. At this particular point in time, there is only uh, one state and that's the state of Victoria under the Victorian Aboriginal Heritage Act which actually legislates for repatriation of ancestors and sacred sacred objects. I'd like to see that sort of legislation mirrored right across all jurisdictions and perhaps an overarching Commonwealth piece of legislation that allows for the return of ancestors from overseas. Laura, you're the Director of First Nations at the Australian Museum now. It's a new role and probably reflects the um, higher visibility of our own people in these institutions. From your perspective, what role are museums playing in holding these objects? So it's a, a legacy project that I've taken on essentially. So uh, the Australian Museum is the custodian, the state are custodians of our ancestral remains and our cultural objects. But what's really important and what we can do now is ensure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples control the care, the interpretation and representation of those objects whether they're in public spaces or when community comes to visit. So I would like to see in the future that we could give more agency to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff and to the museum itself that's very open, open to repatriating our ancestral remains so that we can fast track that process. Because this is already traumatic enough when you're engaging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in the repatriation process, but sometimes the length of time that it takes us to complete these tasks can further compound the effects of that. Does there remain resistance to the return of objects um, and remains? Within my cultural institution, the Australian Museum, we're very open to repatriating ancestral remains and secret sacred objects. We still cannot repatriate any of our cultural objects that do not fit those classifications. And so we are working around that by returning objects on long-term loans. One particular area I'd like to look at is cultural revitalisation. Having Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples come into museums, look at objects and work with objects and revitalise those making practices within communities. We've seen this happen with uh, Nawi, the tide bark canoe making here in New South Wales. We've also seen uh, cultural revitalisation using museums with possum skin cloak making, particularly coming out of Victoria and now that's spread here in New South Wales. And I myself and my family are making possum skin cloaks. And weaving is another example. So I would like to see, while we still fight to get our objects back uh, onto country, that in the meantime, while that legislation takes time to be approved, that we can use museums in other ways Matt, just following up from that, what responsibility do you think institutions have to return these objects? 
an incredible responsibility. As Laura was just saying, the cultural revitalization that can come from the repatriation of these knowledges, sometimes in relation to objects as well, repatriating builds museums all around the country. They do spark like a new idea of museums being the one singular place here in the city and spread it back round to the hundreds of, you know, for example, remote art centres, which are in these days representing 20, 25 years of their own history through an art gallery and turning slowly into museums as well. So it's a slow process that, but it's really interesting to watch as well as, um, you know, museums are sort of decentralising a little bit and instead of being the one singular place holding everything in the middle of the city. The arguments sometimes put forward against repatriation are that having the objects on display allows them to be seen and people can learn about what they mean um, and also that the uh, particularly um, important artefacts are better protected in the museum space. From your perspective, what's your response to those kind of arguments and how should they be weighted against the responsibility of returning objects to their traditional uh, places? In our experience here, some of these objects have had for more than 150 years, you know, non-Indigenous voices interpreting them and projecting their own ideas on what these objects mean to them. One of the recent projects we're doing was just allowing the community to have an interpretive layer, you know, in language or, you know, in song or in any way that they want to actually interpret these objects. And it seems like it's um, obvious, but it's actually quite a new thing in terms of just giving this cultural autonomy and the interpretive voice to different sections of the community and allowing them to actually not use these objects, but sort of own them in a, not in a legal sense, but in a moral sense. So I think that's the big shift that's sort of happening in the way that museums engage with these collections and many other First Nations communities are actually looking to what's happening in Australia. Lyndon, I was hoping you could talk us through the process of returning items to country. How do you identify governance and ownership and what challenges arise? Governance and ownership of uh, remains and sacred sacred objects uh, is something for the Aboriginal communities concerned. Often an institution will actually go and back through the archives and do a lot of provenancing research. So uh, communities don't want to just receive back ancestors when they don't know exactly where they're from. And so often in institutions it may have just recorded uh, ancestor from Australia, or it could just say Victoria, it could say something like the Murray River and not give very much detail. So it's about engaging with the communities, getting them back into the institutions and giving them a chance and a voice to actually participate in this process fully. And when that's done, as you can see with the return from Germany earlier, that it's a very powerful thing to do when we engage uh, Aboriginal people in that entire process and that's part of what we call self-determination. At the Commonwealth level we have a lot of remains that return over from overseas that just says Aboriginal Australia. So we don't really know where they come from. So there are many ancestors sitting in the National Museum in Canberra um, out at Mitchell in a tin shed which I say is highly inappropriate. We've had the Aboriginal community calling since the late 70s and early 80s for a national resting place. And what we talk about when we say a national resting place, we're talking about a place that is, shows the dignity that these ancestors should be shown and a restful place. And we're not just talking about just a few, we're talking about several hundred. And there are also ancestors all over the world and some of them just provenance to Australia uh, that need to come back home and be placed in a national resting place. Laura, just following up from that, you have mentioned that the Australian Museum has a position of wanting to facilitate repatriation. But I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more in detail about some of the processes that you go through to make sure that happens. Absolutely. So what we're trying to do is find out as much information as possible about each of the ancestors within our collection. Then what we do is contact communities and see if they are ready um, to have their ancestors repatriated. Not all communities are ready. As some wouldn't know how to repatriate their ancestors. We also don't own very much land in, in certain communities. And so a lot of different uh, problems arise. Uh, where would we rebury ancestors? How would we undertake that process? So it's really important that we support people through that process. So the Australian Museum works with the New South Wales heritage to be able to return ancestors to communities. And it's really important that it's the Aboriginal communities themselves 
who are self-determining in that process of when, where and how. As an Aboriginal woman, what do you hope the impact of your presence within an institute like the Australian Museum will be? But first and foremost to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities is to understand that we need to be within museums. Um, they do control our representation, so it's important that we are there protecting our cultural objects and our ancestors uh, for the future, to be a role model, uh, to show people that these are not Western spaces anymore, that museums can work for us and we should be working with our colleagues within these spaces to ensure that they know how to do these things correctly and in culturally appropriate ways. I hope that the position will also be able to build capacity to have other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people join us within the museum. Um, one of the challenges around repatriation is the resourcing that's needed. From your perspective in that space, what are some of the challenges and what sorts of resources and safeguards could help? Yeah, it does come back to staffing because you see key community members really bringing their own resources to the table, their own networks, their own friendships and their own understanding of the process to actually make it happen. I guess more on a statewide sort of basis, there has to just be more recognition of the role that elders and community members play in the decision-making process. I've also seen that when the repatriation takes place, people feel like a real sense of reassurance and they feel like they've been listened to and heard, which is actually pretty powerful. I wonder if you could share a little bit about what it means to you as a First Nations person to be working in the environment and what a difference it's made to have more people in the sector. It sort of goes up and down over the years. Sometimes a lot of staffing attached to a particular project or a particular push, but then the sort of the funding for that falls away. I think it's really important to create that sustained sense of employment, which is about skilling people in remote art centres and that, for example, too, not just in the big city institutions, because getting information as a two-way street. Lyndon, I want to pick up on an area that you've given a lot of thought to. I was just wondering if you could share with us what you think the opportunities and challenges of using digital technology are to preserve Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture and heritage. The digital age brings with it lots of uh, exciting and new ways of um, recording information, but also we've got vast amounts of information in institutions like all of the museums that we've been speaking about. We've got information in IATSIS, National Film and Sound Archive. And so at the moment, there is a big push to digitise, especially uh, audiovisual materials. Once it's digitised, it becomes much more accessible to people and to family members and communities. And that sort of is a good way of the intergenerational transfer of cultural knowledge in communities through that digitisation process. From your perspective, Matt, what still needs to be done in terms of some further changes? Creating more opportunities for um, culture to be practised is probably the basis of flipping that narrative of museums sort of being these holders of knowledges and informations and objects and ancestral remains. Just creating more social spaces around the country where you know the, the knowledges and informations which are held in museums aren't just left on dusty shelves but actually allowed not allowed, but given to community members so that they can practice their aut cultural autonomy a lot better. And Lyndon, what's your argument for why the broader Australian public should take an interest in the issue? How can they assist in the process? Uh, support uh, Indigenous voices for the National Resting Place in Canberra. And I think that there's, that provides an opportunity to, for all Australians to come together and learn more about the repatriation process. Laura, as a curator, what do you see your role in that process? I believe there's a lot more work to be uh, completed in this space. I feel like it, the work has only just begun. And so something that's really important about repatriation is that when you're giving back to communities, they are also reciprocating knowledge and a whole range of information that can actually increase the value of the cultural collections that museums hold. So giving back is uh, a really good process for Australians then, because then Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities give to institutions and that information is shared with the Australian public. So it's a two-way relationship and a very vital one. Well, thank you. I'd just like to thank you for your time and your insights and sharing your knowledge on this really complex but very important subject. And I'd like to thank my guests, Laura McBride, Matt Pohl and Dr. Lyndon Orman-Parker. 
And thank you for joining me for the journey home, reconciliation through repatriation. I'm Larissa Berendt.